Welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. I'm really excited to share with you a, um, a passage that the Lord put on my heart a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it's one that maybe you've heard of before, you've read about before, maybe you haven't. It's, it's quite an interesting one. Um, and if you will, get your Bibles and turn, open, uh, turn it open to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And I want to read a passage from, the passage from verse 3 to verse 10. And I want someone to read it out for me. Did you just volunteer, Vicky? Did you? She was the only one that really looked at me that I saw at the time. Um, have you got the? Have you got? Look up the ESV after fourteen. So you've already got a microphone. Stand up, okay? You got, that's, you've got to give respect to the Word of God. Chapter fourteen. It's in the New Testament, Vicky. I'm... <laughs> you got it? ESV, please. I just used. We all know that. Verse 3 to 11. Wonderful. Now, it's going to be on the screens. If you don't have it in front of you, that's okay. Jesus anointed at Bethany. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman was blood, very costly. And she said, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before you. And tr truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done. Verse 10 okay. and 11. Judas, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest and him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he saw opportunity to betray him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the ministry of your spirit through your word. We ask that we would be attentive to what your spirit is saying to us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine this, if you will. There is, um, there is a, a dinner being held for Jesus and imagine placing yourself in that room at a leper's house. We know that the Bible tells us it's Simon the leper and um, that in and of itself is quite an important point for us that Jesus is dining with the leper. People that had leprosy, um, uh, you, you, you just don't mix with those types of people. You have a disease that is not just of the skin, but that can decay away at your flesh. And you don't want to catch what that person's got. But Jesus draws to that very person and that very person's house. Not only does he not care about the fact that he is or was a leper, that's how, we, that's how he's identified as a leper. Simon the leper, that's, his, <laughs> that's how he's identified. He was ceremonially unclean. You don't mix with people that are like that. That's our king. First and foremost, we serve a God who finds himself so very attracted to those of us that are unclean, perhaps seen as misfits or social outcasts, the ones that other people will avoid. That's where Jesus makes his abode to be with us. And so Jesus is at this place having dinner at Simon the leper's house, and it tells us, while he was there at Bethany, 
in the house of Simon the leper. He was reclining at table and there was a woman who came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. Pure nard. Alabaster, 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 alabaster. We may not know what alabaster is, but you can find a lot of that type of stone in the Middle East. There's a picture of what alabaster looks like. Can we show the stone, please? Uh, It's a really beautiful stone. That's what it looks like. It's in fact, it would be argued by many that alabaster was a very expensive stone that you would hold something very precious. Some say that the stone would have been more expensive or worth of more value than what was inside. I don't believe that that's the case at all. It's likely that it being pure nard in such a beautiful stone that it could well have been an heirloom something that could have been passed down from generation to generation or a mother to a daughter. Nonetheless, we know that this woman has a flask, an alabaster flask, that she decides to break open at a certain time. We can, we can see parallel accounts of this in Matthew chapter 26. Also, we can read in John chapter 12. We'll go to John chapter 12 in a little while, where this dinner at Bethany takes place. We read in John's account that this woman's name is Mary, Mary of Bethany. Mary, whose sister was Martha and brother was Lazarus. And she decides that she is going to waste away her wealth. But why does she do that? Why does she break what is of value to her and waste it? on Jesus. Why? Because she loves Jesus. If you're taking notes, write this down, let love lead you. Let love lead you. Often, nonsense sometimes makes the best sense. What may seem nonsense is actually what is best sense. Has God ever shown himself to you in a way that causes your heart to overflow and waste. What was it about this woman that caused for her to break what was of value to her? It wouldn't make sense, and we read on that it didn't make sense to those around about them. She had some sort of revelation of Jesus. Let's go back. John chapter 12 Uh, um, that's the chapter after John chapter what? 11, okay. And in John chapter 11, what happens with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? You know that story? Right? Mary and Martha, they're, they're distraught because Lazarus had died. Jesus comes. He speaks. He is the resurrection and the life. He speaks. Lazarus come forth. Lazarus comes back to life. Mary and Martha are overwhelmed. Then we go on to the next chapter, John chapter 12. This woman, Mary, had a revelation of Jesus and she couldn't help but let her love for Jesus lead her. That's quite provocative for me because I think in my life the decisions that I make, serving, giving, laying down, sacrificing, is it being led by love for Him or love for people because I want people's attention or approval or affirmation or even my own self? Is my love for God leading me? Because my love for God is not always going to make sense. I'm not just a bloke that is logical. I've studied science and maths, very logical. And I need things to make sense. But sometimes, sometimes I get so moved by love for God that I'm compelled to do things that just don't make sense. Lord, help me to... Love you that way. Here she sacrificed for Jesus. It's interesting that what we most sacrifice for reveals what we most value. Parents, you know that with children, I've got three wonderful daughters, wonderful most of the time, three wonderful daughters, (laughs) and and I lose sleep, I lose money, (laughs) I lose energy and life. And I, when I'm with them, in certain moments, I think, oh my goodness, they're, they're going to be the end of me. But then I'm reminded that it's never lost. It's an investment. 
It's never a loss. When love compels you, it moves you, it motivates you, particularly in the kingdom of God, it's never lost. It's an investment of worship. How is God calling for you to worship? Are you enamored by His beauty and His majesty? Or have you fallen into a religious humdum, humdum trap where you're just going through the motions and you've forgotten about your first love? This woman, though, for the pure nard to be poured over Jesus, the Bible says, it says, um, it was very costly. She broke the flask and poured it over his head. That, <laughs> that is such a beautiful picture. It was broken. What was expensive was broken, poured over his head, and it was only in the breaking that we see the beauty. It's so important for us to not discount God's holy breakings. <laughs> Has anyone ever experienced a godly breaking? Maybe you're in the room right now and you're feeling very broken. Could it be an opportunity for that which is pure and very costly to come forth and be poured over the head of Jesus? Don't discount it. What if the breaking is not just a thing or a season? What if the breaking is you? What if the what I know we think of ourselves as an alabaster box, but the value of the worship was what was inside. What if the season or the relationship, the circumstance, the trip, whatever it is, what if that is just to break the outside, which, which what we often focus on, but it's to release the inside? Because it's what's inside that matters to Jesus. What needs to break in you? Don't waste it. Maybe you haven't really been broken just yet. But it's in the breaking that the worship can be a beautiful thing to God. This is what Rick Warren once said, he says, your most profound and intimate experiences of worship will likely be in your darkest days. When your heart is broken, when you feel abandoned, when you're out of options, when the pain is great and you turn to God alone. Amen or ouch? This is what it says in John. In John it says, Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, the house fragrance of the perfume. The house with perfume. <laughs> sometimes that perfume is great and sometimes it's intoxicating, I'll be honest with you. What about a bloke that overdoes it with his fragrance? The ch a fragrance can change the whole environment. Well, that's what's happened here. And for this woman, though, it was in the breaking. Can you please pass me that rosemary sprig? I just grabbed it from outside. <laughs> I like rosemary. Anyone like the smell of rosemary? I love it. I love the smell of it. Uh, that when you want to smell something like a, like, like a twig or a leaf, the best way to smell it is you, you break it, don't you? That's what you do. You rub it. I love rosemary, especially when it's stuffed into a lamb roast. It smells even better then. It's only in the breaking... The fragrance it can fill the room. Smell it. I mean, tell me you don't like that. Is that good or what? No point giving it to you. We're going to pray for deliverance later. You can't smell. Smell that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's when you break it that the fragrance. You know, that we are the fragrance of Christ. We, that, that, that's us. Now, when we're broken, what do we smell like? When you go through your breaking season, what do you fill the room with? Don't want to know. <laughs> because what we smell like determines how we handle the brokenness and what comes out of us. 
Sometimes, to be honest with you, when I go through my breaking days, my breaking weeks, my breaking months, my breaking years, I don't smell too good. But as I allow His Spirit to grow me, mature me, develop me, I smell more like Jesus in each of those seasons. So the breaking is an opportunity for the fragrance of Christ to permeate so that other people can enter around you and say, really? I I don't know what it is you've done. I don't know what you've been through, but there is something beautiful about you. I don't know what it is. True? What needs to break in you? And in your brokenness will be an opportunity for wasting that opportunity, that, that pain, that, that worry, that was an opportunity for worship. But for that to happen, you've got to let love lead you through every single season and allow the breaking to come. This woman broke from a place of love and of health. She loved Jesus. Verse 4 says this, There were some who said to themselves, indignantly. Does your Bible say indignantly? Mine does, or with indignance. Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. 300 denarii. We maybe don't know what 300 denarii is, but a denarii is about a day's wage. When you work for one day, you get a denarii. 300 denarii is about 300 days. Imagine working 300 work days and accumulating all of that in wealth and then wasting it in a moment. Just in that moment. And it might seem humanly wisdom in the natural to think that is such a waste, you could have done something more with that, but Jesus didn't affirm that ideology. Jesus affirmed the one who worshipped, who demonstrated love. They were indignant. Who were them anyway? Who was the crowd? Who was the ones that were around Jesus at the table? Who, who actually rebuked her? Was it believers or unbelievers? Believers. It was the disciples. It's funny that it's often in the house and in God's family that we get the rebuke. Sometimes some of the most painful and abrasive remarks comes from within God's family. It's not just the outside. See, for me, I have found it a lot easier to fade the crowd of people that I don't know or that don't know God, but it's, it's often the people that I love the most. And, and what these people, is, they were giving commentary. The crowd in the house was giving commentary. It scolded her. How dare you do this? What a waste this is. So remember this, fade the crowd. There will always be critics. There will always be critics, and the critics that we must find it, uh, 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 that we would find hardest to overcome are the critics in God's family. Lord, at times, would just forgive me, Father, for moments where I criticize and I'm cynical towards others, and, and from my insecurity, Lord, that I rebuke others, where I see them loving you passionately overwhelmingly, forgive me times where I judge them, even in my heart. I wonder if we've ever been guilty of that. But this, this woman anointed Jesus, and it was actually customary for when a special guest came into a house that you would put a bit of oil, you would anoint them on their head. This woman knew that he was a really special guest. In fact, we were talking in our staff meeting in Psalm 23 on Monday, 
It says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It says, you prepare a table for me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You prepare a table for me. So I'm a guest at your table and you anoint my head with oil. So the guest would always be anointed with oil, but this woman, she went above and beyond. In fact, I wonder, I mean, we, we, we read... In uh, Mark chapter 11, I think it is, Mark chapter 11, Jesus had his triumphal entry in his way to Jerusalem. He was a king. I wonder if she had a revelation, not just of how great he is and not just that he was a guest, but that he was the king because he just had this, this, this incredible entrance. So there was something that Mary knew and she was moved in that the disciples did not agree to. She saw him as king, saviour, <laughs> lover, redeemer and she poured the oil over him and she didn't give a rip about what they said. Do you know how we know that? Because she didn't defend herself. She faded the crowd. This is what Steve Jobs said. Put that slide up please. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. I, I've tweaked that. <laughs> Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out my inner voice, says God Almighty. Can you see the red there? The Lord Almighty says to us, Don't let the noise of others' opinion drown out what I am saying within you. Because sometimes the Lord will speak to you deep in your spirit and you can't let the noise around you, the crowd around you, the criticisms, the opinions, dissuade you from doing what you feel is right. Sometimes there are people that will have the best of intentions. And they'll give you their opinions. All well-meaning. But you've got to learn to turn the volume down. When I finished studying at university, I decided I just want to serve God. I started going to Bible college, started serving in, in this church, and I would have uh, one uncle from one side of the family give me a hard time about it, and one uncle from the other side of the family give me a hard time about it, both Christian men, both Christian men, and they would say, don't waste your engineering degree, do something with it. You can always come back and serve God in ministry later on in life. Get a job, get yourself established in a home, buy a house, get a family, and then once that's all established and you've got a good platform, a good foundation, you go back and then serve and minister in the church. And I'd get it every Christmas and Easter, constantly. Now, I had to learn to go, hang on a second. I know what God's saying to me, and we all have to know God's voice for us. What He says to me may not be the same for what He's saying to you, but I had to be true to what I felt God was saying. There was a conviction, and it had to get to the point where I said to each of those uncles, has God spoken to you about my life? Well, not exactly, but that's wisdom, what I'm telling you. I said, has He spoken to you about my life? No, He hasn't. I said, okay, well, respectfully, let me live it. There's got to come a point in our lives where we say, I am living for an audience of one. I'm not here living for you, and you're not here living for me. You're not even living for your spouse. You're not living for your children. You're not living for your parents, your boss, you're not the, 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 your employees. You are living for Jesus. Let him lead you. Fade their opinions. Let it go. Let them criticize, even with good intentions, and if they might be offering criticism. Listen, but understand the place. Turn the volume down and let his voice be the loudest that you hear in your ear. And God's people said, Amen. So we see then, this woman decided to just pour it all out for Jesus. Jesus ends up defending her. But that reminds scriptures in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath. <laughs> for of what account is he? Well, in other words, why do you care about living for people? 
Why do you care about their opinion? What is man anyway? That's Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22. This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 20, 10. After he, after he opens up and he's very stern, very strong, in his opening um, uh, monologue there for Galatians. Am I now seeking the approval of man? Or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I was still, if I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So my question is, who are we living to please? I just got back from India. I happened to bump into one of the pastors, and um, during one of the breaks, he said to me, "Pastor, whereabouts is your church from?" Where are you based? I said, well, I'm based in Perth. And this is what he said to me, and it stopped me in my tracks. He goes, is there persecution where you live? And I thought, oh. I said, no. Where I live, not really. If there is any persecution at all, which I wouldn't call it persecution, it's, 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 but that's nothing. That's nothing. And here we are, the world, worried about if other people like our Facebook posts or not. <laughs> or, or, or looking down on us if we say anything. So being around people like that reminds me, hang on, am I really living for Jesus? It's quite a challenge, actually. It's a very hard for those types of people. May we be people do not let the opinions, the criticisms of others give us our sense of identity. If we live criticisms, excuse me, if we live we die when they criticize us. That's why we're an audience of one. Jesus then said, leave her alone. Leave her alone. Back off. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you and when you can do good for them. But you will not. That's all God wants us to do. Just to do what we can. She's done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand. She come ready. Beforehand, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the world is done, will be told in memory of her. She had to guard her heart as people were criticizing. And she didn't vindicate herself. Who vindicated her? Jesus did. He's such a better defender of us than we could ever be. Do you know that? I have to learn this the hard way. I'm so stubborn sometimes. I just want to defend myself and justify myself. But he does a far better job than me. I remember there was a season in my life, a number of years ago, I was getting really ticked off because there were accusations flying my way. I was getting real mad, actually. I said, God, how could you let this happen? I want to say something, but I felt like the Lord say, zip it. Seriously, it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, do you want to vindicate yourself or let me do it? And I was taken to Psalm, it says, let's see, where does it say it? In Psalm 27, verse 6 to 8. He will vindicate you in broad daylight and publicly defend your just cause. Wait patiently for the Lord. Wait confidently for Him. So in the process of our breaking and listening to criticisms and oppositions, we've got to guard our heart. Because he will always, always, always lift up those that are bowed down. That's what he's doing with this woman. She's bowed down. Right? She's giving what she has to Jesus. And what's the Lord Jesus doing? He's lifting her up. That's what he does. That's a promise. That as we humble ourselves, he will exalt us. I was praying with some pastors just on Friday. Um, some local pastors, and we're praying about this. Lord, may a humility come upon your people. So often we want to exalt ourselves. Lord, humble. Lord, let a humility come. It's in the humility that God lifts. And as we're bowed down, as we give all to Him, He takes care of us. He defends us. He vindicates us. He blesses us. And that's what he's doing to this woman. In fact, he says, wherever the gospel is going to be preached, there will be a memorial to her. We're still talking about this woman. You can read about this woman in other gospels. She, she, that's her claim to fame now, particularly as she breaks. This is the alabaster woman. Psalm 145, 
14, the Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. But we see here two hearts connecting. We see Mary, who has a heart of overflow through a revelation of who Jesus is. And then we see another man, Judas. It says, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. This is what it says in John chapter 12, verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And then Jesus said, leave her alone. So it was Judas. It was Judas who led the charge that said, how dare she? How is it possible? Let's ask, let's ask a, a, an important question of the text. How is it that Judas, who was with Jesus for all of that time, he saw what Jesus did. He would listen to Jesus' sermons. He would probably go to bed listening to Jesus, waking up, talking to, with all the other disciples. How is it that Judas then turned around and was so interested in money that he sold Jesus for some pieces of silver. They say that the silver was probably worth maybe $1,000 in comparison to the alabaster, which could be forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, relatively speaking. Well, because his heart was not right. In fact, I wonder if Judas, on the outside all along the way, really didn't have the revelation of who Jesus was, but on the outside, perhaps projecting maybe an alabaster-type scenario, being with Jesus, being one of his disciples, but yet he was a thief from the beginning. And he counts it all, 300 denarii. It could have been used, but he was a thief. He just wanted it for himself. So we see a juxtapositioning of Mary... And Judas, see, when you're in love, when, you, when love leads you, we don't measure what we give. But when we're not in love, we measure everything. That's why love is so important. And here with Judas, he knew what was up. He was thinking about himself. I feel a little bit sad for Judas because he was a man in bondage. He was in bondage to his own greed, his own selfishness. What happened to him at the end? How, what happened? What do we read happened after he betrays Jesus? He what? What did he do? He killed himself. Can you imagine what was on the inside of this man? The shame, the guilt that he, he, was in, he was a man in bondage. His heart was not right. I wonder if our hearts are okay this morning. The breaking is an opportunity to see what's in the heart. How has God allowed you to be broken? And what's coming from you? And Mary, we see a breaking, a beautiful fragrance of aroma, of, of, of worship came out. But with Judas, when he was broken, he hung himself. I like juices. I like freshly squeezed juice. Am I the only one? And at home, oh, I like orange juice. Sometimes I put a bit of lemon in there, a little bit of apple. Sometimes if I'm in the mood and it strikes me, a bit of carrot, mix it in there. But it's mainly orange. And you know what I love when I start making the juice? It's when you cut the fruit, the orange, the lemon. When you cut it, you can smell it straight away. You cut the outside, the rind, and it just smells. The rind. And then what I do is I'll squeeze it. And, and when you squeeze the juice, sometimes you dump or the container. And I don't like that because I'm an Indian. I, I don't waste a thing. That's kind of like us. When we go through our season and there's a breaking or there's a 
cutting, there's a way what can be used as worship. When we go through our seasons, when we go through our struggles, when we go through our pain, let it be poured out on Jesus. Don't moan. Just go, oh, Lord, this sucks. I hate it. But I tell you what, I'm giving it to you in worship. You be honored here, Lord. As on every drop is being squeezed out of me, may it be, in a sense, a drink offering that brings you joy. Because I'm here to tell you, friends, when you Jesus... It's not all going to be hunky-dory rosy. There are going to be moments that are really hard. In fact, Jesus gives the promise, you're going to suffer, friends. If it's happened to me, it's going to happen to you. The closer you get to me, the likelier it is for you to experience what I've experienced. To don't, not to waste, but see it to be used as I'm going to invite the team to come. We're just going to spend the moments in worship. I know it's a bit muggy in here this morning, isn't it? That's okay. You're being broken. <laughs> Give it to Jesus. <laughs> Let's stand up to our feet together, can we? I've asked the team to just lead us in a song. Whether you're young or old, this is what I want to encourage you to do. Imagine yourself as an alabaster box. We'll spend a few minutes doing this together. And then after that, we're going to have communion. That's how we're going to finish. But imagine yourself as an alabaster box. And say, Father, how is your spirit wanting me to be broken and poured out upon you? What is in me that you're breaking or that you want to break? What is in me that I'm holding on to, that I'm too rigid about, that I'm trying to keep to myself and that it's so precious to me? But what is it that I need to just give to you, place in your hands and then be given to you as worship? Can we pray that just now? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. It's the only name that matters. And we ask you, would you speak to us? I thank you, Lord, for seasons that are not always easy. But they're opportunities for you to be honored and exalted. And as your people, we come to you. And we present ourselves as living sacrifices. There is a sacrifice element here, but we are alive as we sacrifice. As we put ourselves on the altar, so to speak, I pray that we are not sacrifices that try to squirm and get off the altar, but we say, Lord, we're yours. We want to worship you. There is nothing wasted. We give you our hearts. We give you our affections we give you our attention the things that we admire we we bring it to you and right now we look to you and we ask you to be honored we hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from grace life church for more information about us or any of our services please visit our website at gracelife.com.au